Hello, my name is Nick Hutchinson. I'm an RPA and an RWA. I work for Tracercore and I'm going to talk to you about the management of naturally occurring radioactive material or NORM during decommissioning activities. NORM is a term which is used to describe ores, rocks, um, etc which have natural levels of radioactive elements such as uranium, thorium and potassium and also their decay products such as radium isotopes and radon. TENORM which stands for Technically Enhanced Naturally Occurring Radioactive Material is probably a more accurate term for norm encountered in the oil and gas industry. It describes material with enhanced levels of radionuclides due to the chemical and physical processing that goes on inside process equipment. The norm that we encounter in process equipment comes largely from the decay of uranium-238 and thorium-232 which are both widely distributed in the geology of the reservoir rock. Both these parent radioisotopes decay over billions of years to produce a series of daughter radioisotopes including radium-226, radium-228, radon gas, lead-210 and polonium-210. These daughters may be transported in the aqueous and gaseous phases when oil and gas is recovered from the reservoir which results in norm deposits in enhanced concentrations due to these chemical and physical processes which take place in process equipment. In oil production operations the material is generally observed as deposits of barium sulphate scales containing enhanced levels of natural radionuclides that have been leached from the reservoir geology. The barium sulphate formed results from a chemical incompatibility between the reservoir formation waters and the injected seawater with the subsequent formation of this chemically inert and highly insoluble material within process equipment. In gas fields, norm is largely encountered in a form much different to that experienced in oil producing facilities. Without the fluid production conditions for encouraging the formation of barium sulphate, the presence of the radioactive gas radon in the reservoir gases and its subsequent decay is thought to contribute to the deposition of very thin layers of lead-210 and polonium-210. It is also believed that lead and polonium are also transported as ions in process fluids. With regards to the location of norm deposits, you can almost guess where you're likely to get these deposits. Wherever you've got the most severe temperature and pressure changes, um, there is a good possibility that you could encounter norm in process equipment. Examples include production tubulars, valves, separators, water process lines and condensate process equipment. In all of these locations, there is a very good chance that you can encounter norm. The nature and appearance of norm can vary considerably depending on the location and process. Norm may appear as not only scales and thin deposits but also sludges, sands, waxes and be present in produced water. In terms of the specific activity or activity concentrations encountered this can also vary significantly for reasons already mentioned. Typical values of norm found in the North Sea are illustrated below each photo. In gas production facilities the norm deposits are often not obvious due to the very thin layers of lead 210 and polonium 210 which become attached to process equipment. Although this material may be fixed in the first instance it is important that these items are treated exactly the same as equipment contaminated with scales or sludges. That is they are wrapped and labelled as contaminated. Failure to do so could result in rust forming and highly active material potentially contaminating adjacent areas or personnel. When working with NORM there are two important issues we need to consider. We need to work in accordance with the regulations which are in place to protect the workforce and we need to work in full compliance with environmental legislation in order to protect the environment from any discharges or disposals of radioactive waste resulting from the decommissioning process. The former is achieved by compliance with the requirements of the Ionising Radiations Regulations 2017 and the latter by ensuring that any disposals meet the requirements of site permits, licences that are held by the installation. In order to determine whether the waste we encounter is radioactive, we first need to screen the item or material using a handheld contamination monitor. 
If we are able to detect readings which are sustainably above background, we would treat the material as active, and if possible, take a representative sample or samples and send the material for radiochemical analysis and subsequent waste categorization. Gamma spectroscopy will enable us to determine the activity concentration for radium-226, radium-228 and lead-210. Alpha spectroscopy will allow us to determine the specific activity of polonium-210. These radionuclides, together with thorium-228, allow us to categorise the waste and so identify a suitable disposal route. There are three categories of waste which may be determined using radiochemical analysis results and values included in our environment legislation. These are out of scope, material or waste which is not considered to be radioactive in the legal sense, in scope but exempt, material or waste which may be disposed of without a permit, and finally in scope and non-exempt. This is material or waste which will be subject to authorised or permitted disposal. A simple summation rule is used to calculate whether the waste is out of scope, that is not radioactive. Together with our radiochemical analysis results, the radionuclides highlighted in blue in the table are those we use for the summation. If following the in or out of scope summation the waste is considered to be in scope, i.e. radioactive, applying the summation rule with the values for exemption allows us to determine whether the waste is exempt as type 1 or type 2 norm. Exempt waste is radioactive, but a permit may not be required for disposal. It is likely to be less costly to dispose of this type of waste than non-exempt waste. It should be noted that exempt waste cannot be disposed of to C. The disposal options for type 1 norm waste are listed in this slide. In terms of disposal routes, the waste may go to a normal landfill site, provided there aren't any other hazardous materials within the waste. Um, the waste may go to a normal incinerator, uh, an incinerator which is used to incinerate normal household waste, or it may go to a permitted person, which is a site which holds a permit which allows them to dispose of radioactive waste. The exemption is conditional, meaning that um, the maximum annual limit which can be disposed of via landfill is 50 gigabacrols, and for incineration that maximum limit is significantly lower, it's 0.1 gigabacrols or 100 megabacrols per year. Disposal of type 2 norm waste is detailed in this slide. Um, this type of waste may be disposed of to an assessed landfill site. Um, the waste may be disposed of to a permitted person, which as we mentioned earlier, is a person or a site who has a valid permit in place which enables them to receive and dispose of radioactive waste. An assessed landfill is one where the disposer has provided a robust radiological assessment to the relevant agency and this demonstrates that the radiation doses are not to exceed um, the following. So in terms of dose to workers at the place of disposal, this should not exceed one millisievert per year. And members of the public, it should not exceed 300 microsieverts per year. Again, this exemption is conditional. So the site where the waste arises must keep adequate records of the waste which is disposed of from the premises. If after applying the summation rule to determine whether the waste is radioactive or radioactive but exempt, the waste is considered neither, then the material will be categorised as radioactive and non-exempt, meaning that a permit will be required for disposal or transfer. In terms of disposal routes, provided that a permit is in place, this waste may be disposed of to sea, it may be re-injected into the well, it may be sent onshore to a specialist incinerator, which holds a permit to incinerate such waste. It may be sent onshore to a specialist landfill site, which also holds a permit, which enables disposal of radioactive waste. Um, and another option would be to send it to the low level waste repository in North West England for conditioning and burial. In terms of contaminated equipment, um, the two main options are it could be cleaned or the items could be cleaned offshore, provided that space is not an issue. Um, the more likely option is that the items are sent onshore to specialist cleaning contractors who would clean the items using high pressure water jetting. 
Permits are authorizations which enable the disposal and or transfer of non-exempt radioactive waste include limits on the total activity which may be disposed of to the environment. Annual returns must be submitted to the regulator by the end of February for the previous year's disposals. What is reportable will depend on who your regulator is. In Scotland, SEPA require total isotopic activities to be reported, whereas England and Wales, total alpha and total beta are reportable to the Environment Agency. Installations must not exceed these limits. It is important that any facility to be decommissioned has a suitable permit in place with realistic limits included. If disposals are likely to exceed these limits, a variation may be required. Any items or material sent onshore for cleaning or disposal must be adequately wrapped or otherwise contained to avoid any spread of contamination. Individual items will need to be suitably labelled and in particular it should be clear whether the item or material is contaminated or not. In order to do this, yellow norm contaminated labels are used and to avoid any confusion, green norm free labels are also used when consigning non-contaminated items onshore. When working with NORM, the main hazard is that of internal exposure through ingestion or more likely inhalation. For this reason, preventing the material from becoming airborne goes a long way in preventing any internal exposure, which should obviously be the aim. As well as internal exposure, there is also the possibility of an external exposure, particularly if working in low dose rate areas for extended periods of time, which is often the case with specialist cleaning contractors. With regards to dose restriction, the aim should be no internal intake. This may be achieved through a combination of employing well-established work methods and performing the work in accordance with site local rules or radiation procedures, the use of containment wherever possible, the wearing of suitable PPE including RPE, regular monitoring both area and personal, and making sure that workers are adequately trained. In addition, work involving norms should always be subject to a risk assessment. Other non-radioactive hazards must also be considered. There are far more hazardous materials present within vessels. Site local rules must include details of any designated controlled or supervised areas, that is, areas considered to pose the biggest risk. A summary of working instructions including suitable written arrangements for entry into controlled areas. Contingency plans in the event of an accident or an incident involving norm and a dose investigation level, which is a level of dose, if exceeded, must prompt an investigation of how this occurred and what steps may be taken to prevent it from happening again. This final slide includes the sorts of things to be considered prior to any decommissioning activities involving norm. That is, has a risk assessment been undertaken? It's worth noting, in addition to a generic risk assessment involving work with norm, a job-specific risk assessment may be necessary, particularly if the task to be performed is out of the ordinary. For example, hot cutting of contaminated items, when normal operations would involve cold cutting. Are local rules procedures suitable and fit for purpose? Is there sufficient PPE? RPE and consumables including things like heavy duty polythene, end caps and warning labels. Is suitable equipment available? Have personnel been adequately trained and are they competent? Record keeping, who is going to do this? Similarly, who is going to take samples and record any monitoring results? Is the norm loose or is it fixed? Can others not directly involved in the work be affected? And transport of contaminated items or material onshore for cleaning and disposal purposes. All of these things need to be considered prior to any decommissioning activities.